So we, we can't have an inclusive economy unless we have inclusive business. And uh, one of the things I agree with with Arthur is that intrinsic motivators are much more powerful than ex extrinsic motivators. And one of the things, uh, before you go on to the, uh, the panel of misery at 515, give you a, a bit of uh, hope as you can maybe carry in and through that panel. Um, millennials uh, represent 50% of the world's workforce. And uh, they also are about to inherit $30 trillion in the coming decades, which will be the largest wealth transfer in the history of humanity. And one of the things that distinguishes this demographic, which is larger than the boomers, larger than Gen X, et cetera, <clears throat> one of the things that distinguishes this, uh, this population globally is that they no longer want to have the work-life balance that we think about. They want work-life integration. They want to bring their whole selves to work every day. They see business as a tool um, that can be used as a force for good, good for the workers, good for the communities, uh, good for the environment. And as this sort of tidal wave of energy is coming into the marketplace, uh, business is uh, adopting a place in culture similar to what music was back in the 60s and 70s, which is no longer a bit of entertainment or, in this case, a way to earn a living. But it's a source of identity. Uh, what you wear, what you buy, uh, where you invest, where you work uh, is a part of your identity. And so what's happening now is we're at the beginning of an inflection point where we're witnessing one of the biggest uh, global culture shifts and one of the most important trends of our lifetime, which is that group of people that are the people that every CEO is trying to attract and retain, uh, that they're trying to turn those customers into evangelists and, and those, all those wealth managers trying to attract their, their capital and build products for them, they're going to have to compete on a, on a, in a new way. And those businesses are going to compete not just to be best in the world, but those businesses are now going to be forced to compete to be best for the world, best for their workers, best for their communities, and best for the environment. And like Senator Warner has said, um, just talking about it isn't going to be enough. Because in an age of social media with digital natives, um, radical transparency, they're going to demand uh, proof. As Cass Sunstein said the other day, uh, what is the evidence for what you claim? And so uh, those companies are going to be adopting uh, impact-oriented governance structures like the Benefit Corporation. Uh, that's passed in over 32 states with broad bipartisan support. Um, and they're going to need to adopt impact management tools um, to, to measure and manage the impact of their business uh, so that they man measure and manage their impact with the same amount of rigor as they do their profits. Um, one, one type of those companies are called B corporations. Um, and so just like we get the government we deserve, we also get the businesses we deserve. Mm. And so the power, to echo Senator Warner, the power is in the hands of you. Because uh, you are uh, the investors that decide what you want out of your investments, uh, whether you only want to make more money or whether you want to make money and make a difference at the same time. And so the most important thing you can do when you leave here uh, as an investor is to say, what is the measurable positive impact that my investment is having on the world? And the most important question that those millennials can ask when they go into the labor force, when they're interviewing for a job, and they're the ones interviewing the employer, what is the measurable impact that your company is having on the world, and how can I contribute to do more of that? That's what the B Corp movement's all about.